Today's scripture reading is taken from James chapter 1, verses 17 to 27. Listen to the word of God. Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father, who created all the lights in the heavens. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. He chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word. And we became the kind of fr first fruits of his creatures. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. So get rid of all the fear and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts. For it has the power to save your souls. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it is like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and you and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. If you claim to be religious but don't control, the, don't control your, your tongue, you are fooling yourself, and your religion is worthless. Pure and junior religion in the sight of God, the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress, and refusing to let the world corrupt you. Amen. Today's sermon title, Learning to be a Disciple, will be delivered by Pastor Stephen Lacus. Good morning, everyone. May the grace and peace of Christ be with all of us today. Praise God. Praise God because this world, His creation, truly is a wonderful, wonderful place. Every corner of the world is filled with things of amazing beauty and amazing value. And there's no place in the universe that matches what we have here. The only problem is that our human eyes very quickly get used to all of the wonders around us and then we just stop seeing them. We stop noticing them and we even forget then that they exist. Before our family moved to Taipei, we used to live in Heidelberg in Germany. There it is back again. It's a small place, a small place with only about 100,000 people who live there. But over the summer, three million tourists come from all over the world to experience the beauty of that small place to cruise along the river, to take photos of the castle ruins, to sit in cafes in our romantic streets and drink in the centuries of beautiful history held in that small, small place. But I have to say that after living there for so long, we, like so many of the other locals, just stopped seeing the beauty that was there. We stopped seeing the beauty that was around us. It became normal, it was ordinary, and then it just disappeared from view. One of the dangers of human nature is that we quickly lose sight of the goodness, of the wonder, and of the multitude of tiny miracles that do surround us every day. And instead, we so quickly let our eyes adjust to seeing only the problems and only focusing on the things that we feel are wrong around us. When that happens, it's so easy to forget that this world is God's incredible creation. It is a place that's full of miracles, full of joy and life, beauty and opportunities, full of love and goodness. Now, that's not to say the world doesn't have its problems. It does. It really does. But when we remember that this world is good, when we remember that this world is created and loved by God, that it has value, then we don't give up on this world and we don't give up on society and we don't give up on ourselves either. We don't give up just because of those problems. 
I really can't stress how important that is for us, especially for us in the church, how important it is for us to remember that. In this world, there are already too many people who have given up. There are already too many voices that encourage us not to see the goodness that is around us. There are too many voices that want us to believe that there is nothing good that's left in God's world at all. They tell us the problems that we have here have become too great. They tell us it's too late to save the world from dying. It's too late to make a difference. It's too late to have hope. It's too late to hope that things will get better. Those voices encourage us to give up. They encourage us to just accept the cynicism and pessimism of life that says that everything is broken, everything is bad, and that life and this world have nothing more to offer than just misery and despair. But none of that is true. None of that is true. Yes, there are many problems that face us in the world today. Yes, we have to face problems at home, at school, at work. But as Christians, we know that these problems aren't a reason for us to give up. As Christians, we hold on to God's promise that He is leading us and He is leading this world forward, on to good things. Yes, there are problems, but we are all on the road. We are all on the move. We're all being led and pulled forward by God towards a changed future, a changed future of wonderful goodness. So as Christians, we don't give up on hope because we know that Christ is the winner. We know that Christ is the Lord of all things and we know that the problems and evils of today are doomed to failure. And so we never stop believing. We never stop believing that through God's leadership, we are all changing. The world is changing. And we are changing for the better. 2,000 years ago, this was the good news that Jesus announced to the world and to us all. That the kingdom of God is finally here. Jesus walked among the crowds in Judea. He walked among those who were sick and tired. He stood with those who were pushed down and abused. He faced those who were ignored and rejected and miserable. And he proclaimed the incredible good news, the good news of God that was coming to them all. That there is no reason to give up hope because God's kingdom is breaking into this world right now. God's kingdom of goodness and fairness, God's kingdom of justice and peace and love is pushing its way in. It's pushing its way into this world. It's pushing in, rolling over and crushing the evil and unfairness that is in this world. Jesus announced the good news that through His power, His kingdom, this kingdom of God is breaking into this world and is changing things now making things better. And he called us to help. He called us to join him in helping this kingdom to spread. Jesus came to save us, and it's his power alone to do that. But he still called disciples, disciples to come, disciples to come and follow him, to be fishers of men together with him. Jesus announces the good news, that the kingdom of God is pushing into this world, and then he calls us to respond to that good news, to believe it, to trust in it, and to grab hold of God's kingdom from our side and to pull it into our world and to make it more and more real each day. To do that, to do that, to join Jesus in this work, that's what it means to be his disciple. In our faith life, believing is good. Believing really is good. But we mustn't let ourselves forget that Jesus calls us to do more than just believe. Jesus calls us to follow. To follow him. To follow him and cooperate with him in moving this world forward. 
to cooperate with Him and join with Him in caring for those in need, to stand up for love and compassion, to work for what is right and good and true. That's what it means to be a disciple. Not just to be listeners of the good news, but to be actors and workers, partnering with God to work towards changing this world for the better. To be a disciple is to stand side by side with Christ and to be determined to work and support the same goals that Christ himself right now is working towards. To be a disciple is not to give up, not to fall into cynicism and hopelessness, not to think that there is no hope left for this world, not to think that this world or our lives have no value. To be a disciple is to know that this world, our society, our lives, everything was created and established by God in goodness. To be a disciple means being determined to work with Christ, the Lord of this world, to support this world and to support those in it, to spread God's kingdom of goodness and to push this world further down that road toward a future of goodness. In the Bible stories, when Jesus called others to become his disciples, the Gospels tell us that those people immediately dropped what they were doing. They dropped what they were doing and they immediately followed Christ. Because that was just far too amazing an opportunity to let go of. It was something far too amazing. That opportunity was far too great. Far too great to be something, to be part of something like that. Just to let that opportunity go past. But the good news is that today, Christ still gives us this opportunity. He's still calling to us today to become his disciples, to work with him in changing this world for the better. None of us have missed out on our chance to join in. Now to some of us, to be a disciple might sound difficult, but it's really something that all of us can do. We don't need to leave our jobs or leave our families to do that. It's something that Jesus calls us to do every day, wherever we are. This whole month of September, this month in the EM, we're going to focus on this topic of discipleship. And we're going to have a series of sermons that focus on the active work of our faith, how we put our faith into practice. It's a topic that the letter of James helps us to understand really well. Then... After this month of discipleship, the next month we're going to start a year-long course looking at this topic of discipleship, learning how to be a disciple, trying to understand how we can do that job of putting our faith into practice, how to serve God's kingdom in this world. But today in our scripture reading, in that short, short text, James already gives us six vital tips that start us on the road to understanding discipleship life, that start us on the road to understanding what we need to do to be Christ's disciples. We don't have time to look at all six of them today, but we're going to slowly work through these points over the next month. This morning, I want us to look just at the first two points, the first two points and discover how we too can start being active disciples of Christ. The first tip that James gives us is that we have to come to the life of discipleship with the right attitude. In verse 19, he mentions two qualities in particular. He says we must be quick to listen and slow to speak. On the surface, that doesn't sound like anything so special. It doesn't sound so earth-shattering or so unusual. But this is an incredibly important first step for us to take. It's important for two reasons. First, the easiest way to start helping others and to make a change in their lives is simply to listen to them, to listen and to understand what they're going through. 
Normally, in our day-to-day lives, we're also very eager to speak. We're also eager to share our own ideas and tell others what we think, tell others what we want. It's normal for us to focus on ourselves. But when we do that, we end up pushing others aside. We push their needs aside, too. Christ calls us instead to reach out to others, to be compassionate to others and to care for them. But we can't do that if we don't even take that very first step of being prepared to listen to them. I think all of us knows how frustrating it can be, how hurtful it can be when people don't listen to us. How many times have we come out of business meetings just thinking to ourselves, if people there only stop to listen to my ideas? Or how many times have we felt so frustrated because we wanted to share something with our parents or share something with our partners or our friends, but they just didn't seem very interested to listen? Back in my student days, as some of you already know, back in my student days, I used to work nights as a bartender. And there too, I saw how so many people would come to the bar night after night, not really because they're thirsty, but simply because they needed someone to sit and listen to them. Listening brings with it its own healing power. Just being willing to have a patient and open ear, ready to listen to the, con- ready to listen to the concerns of those around us, is already such a helpful thing. It's the type of blessing that we wish that we could find in other people. We wish that we could have a friend who would listen to us. But it's a good reminder to us that we need to start by being that friend ourselves. We need to start by being that type of person for others, a person ready to listen. That's a really easy act of discipleship that all of us can do wherever we are. But there's a second reason that this command to listen is the very first step. Because as disciples, we shouldn't just listen to those around us, we also must listen to Christ. In our relationship with God, we also have to practice being quiet. Practice putting our own desires to one side and instead be willing to listen to what Christ wants us to do. Again, on one hand, this sounds so simple, it sounds so easy, but Christ's disciples didn't find that easy at all. The Gospels are full of stories about how the disciples didn't listen to Jesus, how they didn't pay attention to His teachings, and how at times they even fought back. They fought back against Jesus, thinking His plans were nonsense and that His plans made no sense. Maybe the example we remember the best is the time when Jesus was speaking about how His work as the Messiah was going to lead Him through suffering, through service, into suffering and to death. And we remember how Peter that time was really angry. Peter pulls Jesus aside and yells at Him, telling Jesus that He's wrong. That's not the way it's supposed to go. Peter pulls Jesus aside, yells at Him and tells Him, no, that's not what the Messiah is supposed to do. Peter yells at Jesus because Peter thinks he knows better how to do this work. He thinks he knows better how Jesus should be the Messiah. He thinks he knows better how Jesus should go about changing the world. Jesus then has to teach Peter that no, it's Peter who doesn't know. Remember that Jesus pulls Peter aside and says to him, Get behind me, Satan. Because you're only thinking of things from a human point of view, not from God's point of view. But it's a problem that we have to face in our relationship with God too. Jesus tells us clearly what He wants. He tells us clearly what He expects from us. And yet instead of really listening, we too, we tend to argue. We tend to fight back. We tell ourselves that, Jesus' ideas here are wrong or stupid or nonsense or naive or they're not going to work in our world. And so instead, we try to do things our way instead of doing things Christ's way. But to be a disciple is to know that Christ is our Lord, that we need to do His work in the way that He wants us to do it. 
And this brings us to a very important second point. The second point we want to look at today. In verses 19 to 20, James tells us that a disciple of Christ must be slow to get angry. We have to reject the temptations of anger and reject the temptations of violence. This is hard to do. Again, we think it's easy, but this is hard to do. Because here again, the world tells us that Jesus is wrong on this point. That Jesus' idea here isn't going to work. The world tells us that if you want to change things, the very first thing that you need to do is get angry. My heart really goes out to those of you who work in customer service here because you have to live through this disaster every day. Too many customers really believe this. Too many customers really believe that to get what they want, they need to scream and shout and make a big fuss. They need to be angry to get what they want. Culture and society also gives us this same message. How many times do we see this in superhero movies? The hero courageously tries to win, courageously tries to make a change, but is frustrated and fails. That is, until the villain comes in and somehow makes the mistake of offending the hero or hurting someone that the hero loves, and that's it. That makes the hero angry. And then once the hero is angry with a scream of rage, the hero gains a special power, a power that wasn't there before, the power to hit back, the power to smash, the power to finally destroy and defeat the enemy. We, and sadly, especially our young men, get sold this story all the time. We get sold this story that we can defeat our problems, we can overcome our obstacles, we can achieve our goals in life if only we just get angry enough first. If only we get angry enough to unlock that violence and that power that's hidden within us. The violence and power to smash and defeat our opponents. But James tells us directly today, He tells us directly, understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God wants. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God wants. Anger and violence are not the way to win. Jesus has to make this clear because this idea is not new at all. It was common in Jesus' day too, and Jesus then rejected it as well. In Jesus' day, some of the Jews were desperately waiting for this type of angry and violent hero, this type of angry and violent Messiah to come, a hero who would represent and embody the frightening wrath and anger of God. They wanted a Messiah with an iron fist to come and smash the world and kill all their enemies. One group in particular called the Zealots, weren't going to wait for this violent Messiah to come. Instead, they took this job over themselves. They were a bit like the terrorists of ancient Israel. They took up weapons, they let hate empower them, and then they went around the country attacking and killing people they saw as the enemy. They believed the story that the world was selling. They believed this story that through anger and hate, through violence and through killing, that they could make things better. They believed this idea that through violence and hate, they could even establish the kingdom of God. But here Jesus says, no, this is not the way. This is not the way to make a change in the world. Among the, 12, uh, among the 12 apostles that Jesus chose, we know that at least one, Simon, was one of these zealots. Our Bible scholars tell us that Judas, the one who betrayed Jesus, may also have been a member of this group. The zealots believed that anger was the way to win, that violence was the way to get what they wanted. And when they saw that Jesus wasn't going to do this, when they saw that Jesus rejected this idea and wasn't going to take this path, instead of listening to Jesus and learning from him, they gave up on Jesus 
and rejected him. If we're going to be disciples, it's important that we learn from that mistake. Yes, it's okay to get angry. It's okay to get angry at the injustices and unfairness that we see in this world. It's okay to be furious at the way the strong and the powerful take advantage of the weak and the helpless. But as disciples, we have to listen to Christ. We have to listen to Him and trust Him when He tells us and when He teaches us that hate and anger are not the tools that will change this world and make it better. True change comes through a different way. Not through hate and anger, but through compassion, care and understanding. If you doubt that, if you doubt that that's true, just think for a moment, just think back to the time when you were a student. Which of the teachers back in your student days which was the teacher that influenced you the most? Which was the teacher who truly impacted your life and changed it for the better? I bet you it wasn't the teacher that beat you every day. I bet you it wasn't the teacher who shouted at you and humiliated you every day. Or the teacher who punished you for every tiny little mistake that you made. The teachers who shaped our lives, the teachers who influenced us were the ones who cared for us, the ones who had compassion and understanding, the ones who inspired us with hope and opened our eyes to new truths and new insights about the world around us. That's where true change in our lives came from. Each of us knows this. We've all been through this before. We know this because we've lived this and we've suffered through it. And yet in our Taiwanese schools today, we still have people saying the best way to teach students is to beat them. I think this shows the power, really shows the power and the temptation that anger and violence have. We think somehow that that's the best way to do things. That anger and violence are the best ways to get a result. But again, Jesus says, no, that's not the way. Righteous anger is okay, but to truly change our society and to truly grab hold of God's kingdom and pull it into this world, anger and violence are not going to do that. They are not the way. That's true for the world, that's true for our society, but it's also true for our individual lives and our relationships with others too. Rarely are anger and violence the way to achieve God's goals in the way that we live with others. I'm sorry to say that on one hand. I'm sorry to say that. Because deep down, I think in our, in our broken hearts, deep down there, I think we often really wish that that was true. I think in our broken, sinful hearts, we often really wish that violence was the way, that hatred and meanness was the way to achieving things. We so wish that we could violently criticize others. We wish that we could cut them down with our words and hurt them with the things we say. Because if we're honest... Our sinful hearts tell us that that feels good when we do it. But Jesus teaches us that that's not the way for disciples to live. That's not the way for disciples to act. And in verse 26 of today's text, James tells us bluntly and directly that this use of violence, even just violent language, is not acceptable if we are followers of Christ. Brothers and sisters, if you claim to be religious, James says, if you claim to be religious but you don't control your tongue, then you're fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. We cannot hate. We cannot speak words of hate and still be followers of Christ. As we start this month of discipleship, what have we learned so far? What does it mean to be a disciple? To be a disciple means knowing that God has not given up on this world, but God is at work changing this world, changing our society and changing our lives too. To be a disciple means being willing to cooperate with God, to cooperate in doing this work, to put our energies towards pulling God's kingdom into this world. 
That means working for goodness and compassion, working to encourage more and more people to listen to God's voice and to join Him in making a positive change to the world around us. How can we do that? How do we do that? Well, today we saw the first two steps. We need to listen to others and listen to Christ, and we need to reject the pathways of anger and violence. When others tell us to give up on this world, to give up on God's creation and give up on God's children, we refuse to listen to that or to accept it. Instead, we listen to the voice of our Lord Christ who calls us to come join Him, to join Him in pushing for change. And when others tell us to use violence and anger to make that change, when our own hearts tell us to criticize and attack others, to cut and hurt others with the things that we say, we also refuse to take that path as well. Instead, as disciples, we listen to the law of Christ to love others, the way that He has loved us, and to treat others the way we wish to be treated. The points we have spoken about today are great principles, but they're not just supposed to stay as principles. If we truly are following Christ, then Christ calls us to put our faith now into action. So how do we do that? How do we do that? I'm glad you asked. In your bulletins today, you'll find a little form, this little pink form. On this little pink form, there are a whole range of different discipleship services that you can choose from. There's something on that list that will suit everyone. It really will suit everyone. And there's space at the bottom to make extra suggestions if you have even more ideas. For every Sunday in September, I'm going to hand out this little card with your bulletin. So every week this month, you'll get this. And my hope is, and my goal, well, I hope it's our goal, that by the end of this month, every single person here, everyone in our EM community, will have found a place where they can use their gifts and talents to really be a disciple of Christ to be the disciple that Christ is calling you to be. This church community needs you. Taipei needs you. Our world needs you. And Christ is calling you, Christ is calling you today to take up the gifts and the talents that He's given you and to come. Come be a disciple and follow Him. Join Him in making this world a better place. Let's pray together. Lord Christ, when we look in the mirror, it's easy to get disappointed at what we see. When we look at the world, it's easy to lose hope in what we see. But you call us not to give up, but to focus on becoming the great people you want us to be and on making this world the kingdom of God that you intended it to be. Give us the bravery today to step forward and be your disciples. Give us the strength to listen to you and to use the gifts you've given us to serve you and the world around us. In your holy name we pray. Amen.